Good afternoon and welcome to a special webinar with Mark Miller on the heart of leadership. If you're ready to grow as a leader and desire to make a difference in the lives of others, then we think this next hour will be transformational for you. And it is so great uh, to meet up with Mark. He's actually calling in from Washington, D.C., and I am in the state of Michigan. So if you want to, take a moment and try out the question panel on the right side of your screen and tell me where you're calling in from today because I think we're going to have an audience from a wide range of locations. My name is Becky Robinson from Weaving Influence and before we talk to Mark I just want to encourage you um, for sure throughout the call to type any questions that you have for Mark uh, into, into that question panel that I just alerted you to. We plan to leave most of this hour for your interactions and conversation with Mark and if you type in your questions I'll be sharing those with him. Uh, we also want to encourage you to tweet during the webinar as you hear info that you'd like to share. The hashtag is at the bottom of each slide. You'll see it, Heart of Leadership, and Mark's Twitter handle is at LeaderServe. Now to the main event. Again, I'm thrilled to welcome Mark Miller to join us today to talk about his new book. It's actually already available on Amazon and will be available in bookstores near you on October 21st. The new book is The Heart of Leadership, Becoming a Leader People Want to Follow. Mark is well known as a business leader, a best-selling author, and a communicator. Over the years, he's traveled extensively around the world, teaching for numerous international organizations. As a photographer, he has photographed some of the world's hardest to reach places, including Mount Kilimanjaro, Everest Base Camp, and the jungles of Rwanda. When Mark is not working with Chick-fil-A, writing books, or spending time with his family, you can find him blogging on his website, Great Leaders Serve. Mark, I'm thrilled to have you. Welcome. Thank you, Becky. Thank you very much. And greetings to all of you. Uh, I don't know how many of these sessions you've participated in, but we decided we'd do this one a little different. Uh, I mentioned to Becky about the possibility of you actually seeing my face, because this is uh, the first webinar I've done of that format. I usually just look at a slide deck, so I wanted you to be able to see me, because I want us to have a conversation. I'll just go first. And so what I'd like to do is take you through the content of the book at a very high level. And as Becky mentioned, leave the majority of our time for questions. So I hope that will serve you and uh, get your pen and paper ready to jot down those questions that come to mind. And that will be the focus of our time together. But before we jump to your questions, I want to give you a little context on this book and why it exists. I'd like to ask you a question. What's your point of view on leadership? I don't know if you've ever thought about this. This is a question that Ken Blanchard challenged me with years and years and years ago. He said, what you believe about leadership really matters. In fact, we often do an activity or an exercise in a group setting, and you might want to try this the next time you've got a dinner party that things are moving kind of slow, is pair up and ask people, what's your point of view on leadership? and give them about 60 seconds to give you an answer. Now you may think that sounds a bit theoretical or a bit abstract, but the truth is our beliefs drive our behaviors at a very core and fundamental level. That's the truth of it. And so what you and I believe about leadership really does affect the way we lead on a day-by-day -day basis. Now as Becky mentioned, uh, I do sell chicken for a living. I've worked for Chick-fil-A now for about 35 years, and we came to the realization over a decade ago that we needed a common point of view on leadership. And when we commissioned a team of very smart people, I had a privilege to be part of that group, and we did extensive benchmarking. We did um, interviews. We, we read a couple hundred books on leadership. We were really trying to figure out what's our, our point of view. Well, here's what we came up with. Our metaphor for leadership is an iceberg. And Becky didn't mention, I've also had the privilege to shoot pictures in Antarctica, and they are spectacular. The icebergs that I saw uh, were dramatic. Some of them were 100 feet tall and 600 feet across, but that's the only the part you could see. You knew that the vast majority was below the waterline. Well, we think that's exactly the same with leadership that when we encounter another leader, we're really just looking at about 10% of that leader. And we think those are often represented as leadership skills. Those are the behaviors 
Those are the things leaders do. And that's actually what Ken and I wrote about a decade ago when we wrote The Secret. The subtitle of that book is What Great Leaders Know and Do. And we actually depicted the iceberg in that book. But we knew at that point we weren't telling the whole story. We foreshadowed that there is actually more to leadership, much more to leadership than skills. And those are the traits and attributes we call leadership character. That's the 90% below the waterline. And here's the truth. Most of the leaders I know that get stuck, their careers stall, or they fail, they do so because of leadership character. And skills actually are too easy to learn. If you're focused, if you're disciplined, if you're intentional, you can lead. You can learn to lead. You can learn to cast vision. You can learn uh, to build teams. You can learn to allocate resources. You can learn the skills, but it's often the character where people stumble. Now, it's been fun over the years to talk to people about leadership character because just as soon as the secret came out, people began to ask me about leadership character. And in many of those conversations, I would turn back to them and say, well, what do you think about leadership character? What are those traits or marks that set leaders apart? And people would often say integrity, and they would say loyalty, and they would say honesty, and I would stop them. I would say, no, 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 no. Don't you want those traits from all your leaders and all your team members and anyone affiliated with your organization? And they'd say, sure. And I'd say, well, those aren't the differentiators. Because at the end of the day, the truth is, is that leaders are different. And that's actually what this book is all about. In fact, the working title for many, many months for this book was Leaders Are Different. The premise is that there are a critical few leadership character traits that set me and you apart as leaders. It doesn't make us better than anyone else, but it does make us different we look at the world differently. And if we can raise up a generation of leaders who can cultivate those leadership character traits, we'll set them on the path to success. Certainly they still need to learn the skills. Certainly they still need to be disciplined in that regard. But as we're going to talk throughout this broadcast, if your heart's not right, no one cares about your skills. So with that in mind, I created the heart of leadership. Becoming a leader people want to follow. That's really the acid test. Peter Drucker says there are two tests of leadership. Do you have followers and do you get results? Well, this book picks up where great leaders grow left off. Some of you know that was a book that I co-authored with Ken Blanchard a couple of years ago. And in that book, the hero was a 23-year-old young man named Blake. And he was trying to learn how to lead. Well, this book picks up five years later. Blake now has a wife, a child, and one on the way. And he's been passed over for two promotions. In essence, his career is stuck. So he turns to his mentor that he met in the previous book. And she, rather than giving him the answers that he's looking for, she sends him on a journey to discover the heart of leadership. She knows that he will learn more if he goes on his own on a path that she has carefully orchestrated for him to, to spend time with men and women who knew his late father. And they talk about five critical aspects of leadership character. So what I want to do very quickly is work through these for you. But before I do, one, one more disclaimer. This is, this is what caught Blake off guard. And I think it's, it may have uh, tripped all of us up at some point along the way. He failed to realize that there's a lot more to leadership than great individual work. In fact, the book begins with him talking to his supervisor about his performance. And she says, you do great work, but I couldn't get support for you to be the team lead. He wasn't demonstrating the traits of leadership character. And therefore, his outstanding results were appreciated, but, but they were really dismissed as it related to his leadership capability. 
So he goes on this journey, and he meets with a very eclectic group of men and women. He meets with a coach. He meets with a judge. He meets with a school superintendent. Uh, again, just men and women that his, his father had spent time with over the years, and each one shares with him one critical leadership character trait. The first, and these are not necessarily presented in order of priority, but I do believe that this is the first among equal, and that is great leaders cultivate the ability to think others first. Ken and I talked about this a decade ago. Uh, we challenged ourselves and our readers to ask on a regular basis, am I a serving leader or a self-serving leader? People know. People watch the leader. And so we believe that if you and I can develop this instinct and this habit of thinking others first, it will color everything we do. When the folks around us understand that we really do have their best interest at heart, that we really do want to help them win, it makes all of the other traits much, much easier to cultivate and to practice. The second trait that he discovers is that great leaders accept responsibility. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but when you and I lead, we're not only accepting responsibility for our work and our efforts and our outcomes, but we're accepting responsibility for the work of others. I think that's critical. We have got to be willing to say, yes, this happened on my watch, therefore I will accept accountability. Now, this is actually a two-sided coin because the best leaders understand that although we do accept responsibility, we're also quick to give praise. So the way it often plays out is when things don't go well, we own it. We own it. But when things go exceptionally well, we defer and we praise others. And our people appreciate that and our people know that. But at the end of the day, the buck really does stop with us as leaders. So the third trait that Blake discovers is that great leaders expect the best. This is about an optimistic spirit. Spirit. I don't know how many of you have ever worked with a pessimistic leader. I'm guessing not many, because there aren't a lot of successful pessimists who lead. Now you may say, well, why would that be the case? Well, here's my theory. If you think about what leaders do, fundamentally, we create a future that does not exist. And we have to rally people to that future. So if we don't believe that future is a better version of today, how would we be successful in getting anyone to go with us and support us on that journey? One of the uh, illustrations we use in the book is you may have heard before how you can use a glass of water to determine if someone is an optimist or a pessimist if you fill it half with water. And you ask someone, is it half full or half empty? I think the kind of leaders we like to follow are those men and women that say it's completely full. It's half full of water and it's half full of air, but it is completely full. And Blake understands that he can cultivate a spirit of optimism, even if that's not his natural bent or his natural tendency. So the fourth leadership character trait is a hunger for wisdom. Every decision a leader makes matters. A decision about strategy, a decision about goals, a decision about selection, a decision about termination, a decision about how we're going to use our time and energy and allocate resources. Every decision we make matters. And to inform those decisions, we need wisdom. We really do need to cultivate wisdom, to forge wisdom over time. And in the book, we talk about some ways to do that. Maybe if you're interested, you're in the Q&A. We can talk about that along with these others because part of what we've done in the book is not just to articulate these character traits, but I've attempted to give some very pragmatic uh, things that you and I can do, some activities that we can engage in to make these traits uh, part of our lives. But hunger for wisdom uh, is something that Blake discovers on his journey. And finally, he understands with new clarity that leaders respond with courage. They respond with courage. Many of the things you and I do as leaders require courage, whether it's setting a bold vision, making a hard decision, even allocating resources. This is really about initiative. 
the best leaders initiate. They don't usually wait, and courage is required. Uh, in the story, he meets a school superintendent who demonstrates this quite well. And in doing so, she makes a few people unhappy. She has to remove uh, some leadership for, from some schools. She even closes some schools. And he says, why do you do this? And she says, because I have a white hot passion for the vision. Vision actually fuels courage. So that's one of the tips I'll share with you. If you're having trouble mustering some courage, you've got to ask yourself, to what end? Do I have something that is so compelling that I'm willing to move forward courageously? So at the end of the day, when Blake gets through with all of these, he realizes that leadership character is, in fact, a matter of the heart. Hunger for wisdom, expect the best, accept responsibility, respond with courage, and think others first. If your heart's not right, no one cares about your skills. That, that feels cold, that feels direct, that feels blunt and perhaps abrupt, but I think it's true. And you may know men and women who actually do the work well, but you have questions about their heart. It's my hope and my prayer that some of the content in this book can, can release some of those leaders to contribute at much higher levels than they have in the past. So that's uh, a quick flyby of the content. I'd like to quickly now cut to questions and see if there's anything you'd like to talk about. Thank you, Mark. Um, I have a few questions already, and I'm welcoming more. Uh, I see that more are being typed as we're speaking. I just want to take a quick minute to give a shout out to some of the places these folks are calling in from today. Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Savannah, Georgia, Chicago, Illinois, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Omaha, Nebraska, Dallas, Texas, Seattle, Jackson, Mississippi, Warsaw, Indiana, Rochester Hills, Michigan. Uh, we have almost every single state represented. We have someone calling in from Malta where it's 10 p.m., from Brisbane, Australia, from Rome, Georgia, from Montreal, from Machu Picchu. So um, forgive me if I missed yours. Ah, Machu Picchu. I was yeah. there just recently. I guess I probably gave somebody my business card. Uh, indeed. So I have a few questions and I'm just going to take these one at a time and I'm sure others will be coming in. Um, so the first question is, Mark, uh, the person is saying uh, that he appreciates the five leadership character issues you highlight and write about the book and it's obvious why you chose the five that you did. And he's wondering what other character issues you would say are important and maybe that you struggle with whether to include or not, and obviously didn't, uh, but were close. And if there are any of those, would you share about them? Well, this, this project began, as I mentioned, almost a decade ago, as I began having conversations with people about leadership character. And one of the things I was interested in, once we establish some common ground, that I'm really talking about the things that make leaders different. And I began to collect those. And when I sat down to write the book, I had 33 of them. And I knew that that would probably not be helpful uh, to, to publish a book or to attempt to, to write a book that had 33. I know John Maxwell, who's a friend of mine, he can do the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. But I did not feel like uh, I could do the 33 leadership character traits. I wanted something that was much more manageable. And so hopefully, you know, I've, I've tried to rank and prioritize um, the traits and, and sorted through those and, and lots of debate and lots of discussion. And uh, again, there are many other traits, but I think this is a pretty good starting point. I will say uh, one that, that was really close in my mind that I feel like I've almost covered indirectly is many, 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 many people said, well, leaders have good judgment. Well, I understand that, and, and I would say, yes, leaders do have good judgment. It's, it's the demonstrated ability over time to make good decisions because people who don't make good decisions repeatedly generally don't fare well in, in the business of leadership. But if you, if you look at hunger for wisdom, that was kind of my around the, the bend way to say, and that will fuel good decisions, and that will help you over time uh, forge good judgment. So that was probably number six as I looked at it, and I tried to find a sneaky way 
to, uh, to include it, and it's actually included in some of the dialogue in the book. We actually talk about judgment. My, my quest in life, if I can get really good and cultivate and nurture these five, I think I'm going to be way down the road uh, on becoming that leader people want to follow. But if I master all these, then I can start working on another five or ten. But this is where I'm going to start. Got it. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, there's a couple questions that have come in uh, that have a similar uh, bent to them that I'm going to summarize into one. Um, people are wondering about the empirical evidence or research that led you to these leadership character traits. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, as I understand research, there, there are two fundamental types of research. They're quantitative and qualitative. And this was clearly qualitative. And um, it's based on my experience. It's based on the experience of leaders that I've been hanging around with for 35 years. Uh, I do not uh, submit this as um, exhaustive nor definitive. I think my last response may actually speak to that. There are many character traits that you and I would love to cultivate as leaders, but this seems like a pretty good starting point. Uh, I, I can't imagine leaders that excel that don't demonstrate these traits. So that's my answer. I believe it, it was well researched, but qualitative, not quantitative. Thank you, Mark. That helps very much. Uh, so this question came in from Carol, and she said, what do you do with a leader who will not listen, who has received praise for what they have done, but simply despite clear instructions, refuses to follow directions and keep the leader informed of what they are doing within the team? Well, unfortunately, uh, all leaders, all men and women in positions of leadership should not be in positions of leadership. I mean, there's some percentage of leaders that probably should be individual contributors um, or members of a team, and you may have run into one of those. And those decisions are hard. It goes back to responding with courage. Sometimes that's the courageous, challenging, difficult response is you may have someone who's not in the right position. Uh, Jim Collins, who's a friend of mine and a friend of Chick-fil-A's, might say they're in the wrong seat on the bus. Maybe they're on the wrong bus altogether. But those are hard leadership calls, and um, it happens from time to time. Thank you, Mark. Uh, here's a question about think others first. Nathan says, you talk about thinking others first. I've been guilty of being self-centered many times. Aren't some people more independently motivated, salespeople, for instance, versus team-oriented, and it's a personality trait and not character-based? How do I guide independently motivated people to think others first without working against their natural bent? Okay, I heard a lot. I heard two or three questions in there. Uh, so let me see if I can, I can start at the top and say I believe that character traits transcend personalities. And I know some sales uh, professionals who always think others first. In fact, one of the others they're thinking about are the organizations and the people and the buyers that they're trying to sell to. They're trying to think, how do I serve this person? How do I serve this organization? In fact, the best salespeople I know are not thinking about how I can get rich. They're thinking about how I can serve others. And I actually do know some salespeople who've gotten rich. But it, their orientation was, how do I serve others? So my personal experience has not been that these are in conflict. I think the way we talk about it in the book, it's actually one of the techniques for cultivating this uh, character trait is to try to figure out how you can add value in the life of every person you encounter. And again, I know some salespeople who do this quite well. That's one way they endear themselves to the, to the customer or potential customer. They're always trying to add value. Maybe it's encouragement, maybe it's feedback, maybe it's coaching, maybe it's resources, maybe it's listening, maybe it's a smile. But people feel better when they've been around those type of individuals. And that's, that's one of the reasons that I think it can work even in a sales staff with sales professionals. So I, think, I think sales um, people do have some uniquenesses. Again, I have friends who are in that profession. But these are character traits that I believe transcend personality. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Patrick is asking if you could describe some activities to develop some of the traits described in the book. 
Well, okay, so there was one on Think Others First. Think about how you can add value to others. And I think even, even the conscious act of thinking that, even if you can't add value to every person you meet, the fact you're thinking about it, you're shifting your focus, you're shifting it from yourself to others, I think that could be extreme, it can be extremely powerful. It uh, has been in my life, and I know in, in many, many other leaders who embrace that, uh, that mindset and are actually pursuing life with that filter or that lens about trying to serve others. Uh, another one that you might think about is this hunger for wisdom. Uh, I actually wrote about this last Monday, I think, on my blog. One of the specific techniques is who helps you make important decisions. So my suggestion as a specific tactic is to form a uh, council of advisors. And this can be certainly uh, friends and associates and colleagues and men and women you know, but what I wrote about last week was you can have a, both a virtual board of directors. You can have men and women that you actually don't know, but you still know so much about them and their point of view that you can use them and their perspective to in, help inform your decisions. I was thinking about a couple of people that I have listened to hundreds of hours of their content. And by default, when I'm ready to make a decision, I can immediately think, about lessons they've taught, illustrations they've shared, uh, ideas they've put forth, and that helps inform my decision. So seeking counsel, again, both live, um, folks you actually have a relationship with and in a virtual format is, is an idea for how you can uh, cultivate that hunger for wisdom, is to get other people to help you uh, with that. Uh, to expect the best. This one is, this one is uh, fun because some may go back to the personality question on this because don't some people more naturally expect the best and some people not. I think that actually may be true, but I don't think we need to be a captive of that uh, preference. Because if you and I will believe in our ability to affect the future, because if we can't believe in our ability to create a better future, then we're probably in the wrong role if we're the leader, because that's what leaders do. So I think it starts with a self-belief that even if I can't create the future, I can affect the future. One of my favorite uh, quotes from um, Peter Drucker is the best way to predict the future is to create it. I think the more we believe that as a leader, the more it will affect our thinking and the more I think it will affect our outcomes. So let me share one more. This whole idea of accepting responsibility Again, this will require a little imagination, but if this is not something that you do naturally, I've asked leaders to pretend you own the outcome. And people say, well, own the outcome for what? Say, pretend you own the outcome for everything you work on. Whether you're a member of a 10-person team, a 20-person team, or you own the outcome for your whole department or your whole organization. Pretend, if you're working on something, pretend you own the outcome and begin to see how that affects your behavior. One of the things you'll quit doing, if this is your current pattern, is you'll quit blaming others. Because the best leaders don't blame others. They accept responsibility. So if you pretend you own outcomes, you won't blame. In fact, you may actually be more creative. You may be more diligent. You may start acting more like a leader, because that's the mindset of a leader, that we control or at least affect outcomes. So some of these practices are actually tangible things you can do, and others are things we get to do within our own head and within our own heart. And we change the way we think through, through really through discipline, discipline thought, and it will ultimately change our outcomes, and I think it will change our heart as well. I hope that helps. I think it helps a lot. Some really fantastic ideas there. Uh, so, Mark, here's a personal question for you. Which of these principles has been the most difficult for you? On any given day, any one of them. Um, I think there's a myth out there about leadership that those who are in leadership and even those who've been on the journey for many years, they've got it figured out. Um, I don't know many leaders who have it figured out. In fact, I'm a little bit leery of leaders who have it figured out. I think these are things we have to work on continuously. 
I think when we get tired and we get busy, sometimes it's hard to expect the best. Uh, sometimes when we really feel like it wasn't our fault when somebody on our team does something that was not smart, sometimes it's hard to say, yeah, I own that. I accept responsibility for that because you're thinking in your heart, you know, I guess I own it because I'm the leader, but dead gum, I mean, what were they thinking and why? But you can't go there. Now, you go go talk to them, you know, personally and privately, but publicly, you got to own it if you're the leader. You can't blame. If you blame, remember, the end game here, you want to be a leader people want to follow. And so on any given day, depending on the circumstances, depending on the situation, depending on the scenario, uh, I can struggle with any one of these. But I tell you, what is most detrimental to my leadership is, is when I struggle with thinking others first. If I slip into that mode of thinking about me, and again, I do from time to time, and I really work diligently not to, because when you slip on that one, it makes it really hard to do the others because in part you lose your motivation to do the others because you're, you're, you're now thinking about you. You're thinking about outcomes for you and you're thinking about probabilities and scenarios for you and you're not, you're not thinking about other people. And so that is the one that I think is the most slippery of slopes uh, and I, I work really, really hard. My wife challenged me on that just recently about if I was thinking about myself or I was thinking about the family on an issue. And it just struck, it struck me to the heart. And I just, I had to apologize to her. I said, I, I, you're right. I, I mean, I was wrong. And so I think we just got to be real careful. Um, any one of these can trip us up. I totally agree with you, Mark. Uh, since we're going on the personal questions, I have another one from Lucas. Oh, uh, he wants to know, what is your vision and how are you using the heart method to achieve it? Okay, well, uh, I work for Chick-fil-A Incorporated. Some of you have heard of Chick-fil-A. Maybe my friends in Machu Picchu don't know us. Uh, we are a quick service restaurant company here in the United States, and we're about a $5 billion company with 1,800 restaurants, uh, about 70,000 folks work in those restaurants. And we were with a bunch of our team leaders today here in Washington, D.C., and we were talking to them about our corporate purpose, which is to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that comes in contact with Chick-fil-A and to have a positive influence. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a stewardship positive influence. Glorify God, uh, be a positive influence and a good steward on everyone who comes in contact with Chick-fil-A. We also were talking about our mission to be remarkable, to be remarkable. And so we actually have metrics set up there, and we're trying to, as an organization, uh, fulfill that vision and to accomplish that mission. The way the heart model comes into play is we're trying to be that kind of leaders ourselves, you know, those of us that lead at the home office, and we're trying to help our restaurant operators as they raise up a generation of leaders who can demonstrate these same leadership character traits. Uh, we just think it's a powerful, powerful combination. There's actually an ancient passage that talks about a leader who had integrity of heart and skillful hands, and we think that's a beautiful model. If we can get folks with integrity of heart, meaning that they can do these things and they have the skills that are required and necessary, um, we think you can accomplish a lot of things. Thank you, Mark. Um, Robin says that she loves the acronym HEART and thinks that the traits sound like traits we should use in all aspects of our life, not just in a leadership capacity. Um, she mentions that the one she struggles with most is respond with courage and wonders if you have any tips for how to stay strong in the face of negativity. Well, I think respond with courage is to some extent a learned behavior. And what I encourage leaders to do is to look for opportunities to respond. Because every time you respond, courage is required. Sometimes a little bit, sometimes a lot. Um, and the more we respond, the more responding becomes a natural response. And we kind of strengthen those muscles. Because here's the deal, when you and I fail to respond, in that moment, it may not be of significance, but our failure to respond is cumulative.
because over time people don't see us as a leader who responds with courage. We may say, I'll let that pass, I'll let that pass, I won't speak into that, I won't weigh in here, and all of a sudden that becomes the path, and that becomes the, the stereotype that people have when they look at us and when they think at us, think about us. Now, the second part of that question was, how do you respond with courage in the face of negativity? That makes it harder, clearly. I mean, it really, really does. But I think as, as leaders, we've got to have something that we believe in. As, as the character in the book talks about, I have a white-hot passion for the cause. And when we have that uh, desire to see something come to fruition, that fuels our courage. Uh, combine that with just the habit of responding and initiating and getting in the game and getting in the fray. And uh, I think over time you can, you can cultivate that leadership character trait. Great. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, By so the way, I don't want to make that sound easy. I mean, I don't want to make any of this sound easy. This is heavy lifting. This is hard stuff. This is hard work. This is a lot harder than learning how to run a good meeting. This is a lot harder than learning how to build a team or cast vision or allocate resources. This is hard. This is why it's 90% of our leadership success is determined by these things. And again, skills matter, but this is, this is what makes it really, really challenging. This is hard stuff to do. I, I agree again. So here's a question from Christine Mark. She says that, uh, well, she wonders, do you believe leadership character can be learned and internalized, or is it more a matter of developing leaders who are not naturally heart-led to behave as if they are? Okay, well, thank you for that question. Two-part answer. I believe that these traits can be cultivated. If I hadn't, I wouldn't have written the book. What I want to acknowledge, really to repeat what I said just a moment ago, this is really hard. The best time to learn these things is when we're young. You know, some people demonstrate these as young adults, and it's because their parents invested in them teaching these traits. I mean, at the end of the day, what is parenting? Parenting is really about developing character in young people that we hope will be functioning, productive adults at some point in the future. But for many folks, they didn't get this at home. They didn't get this growing up. So I think it can be done. But every leader doesn't get it. And we talk about that uh, candidly in the book because it actually starts with a decision. A leader has to decide, I see them in being this type of leader. And then once there's a decision, then you can begin to do the things to shape and form and mold and transform your leadership character. Some leaders never make the decision, so that's their stumbling block. Others don't stay the course. Some have more work to do than others. Again, depending on how much of this their parents put in them as children, some, some are coming into the workplace and they got about 80% of this nail, and some are coming into the workplace and they got none of it. And so there are varying degrees of difficulty. I, I want to certainly acknowledge that. But generally speaking, if these things are absent, you've got to work really, really hard to, to make them a reality. And it's a choice. It's a choice. Uh, I was talking to the group this morning about uh, Latin. I don't know if any of you, probably many of you studied Latin. Some of you are probably fluent. Uh, I didn't study Latin. I didn't study Spanish or German or French. I mean, I've been working on English my whole life and still trying to, to figure it out. But I know one Latin word. It's quantubus, Q-U-A-N-T-U-V-I-S. And it means as great as you choose. It really means greatness is a choice. So I found it ironic when I stumbled upon a quote from Jim Collins who said that after all of his work and all of his research, he discovered that greatness is not a function of circumstances. Rather, it's about conscious choice and disciplined action. Well, he wasn't researching this topic, but I think the same is absolutely true. Can a man or woman cultivate these habits of the heart? Well, I think it's a product of conscious decision and disciplined action. And so I challenged the group this morning. I said, Quantubus, Quantubus. 
It's like choose greatness. Make the choice and then make the change. You'll never make the change without the choice. That is super. And um, Mark, I think the next question uh, really ties in nicely to that. Scott has written in and says that he's a young leader. He's 24. Uh, um, and that's how old I am. <laughs> how ironic. Just kidding. Uh, and your books are great and make it easier to share with people in, that he's developing. And he wonders if you have any tips about how to find the traits and nurture the characteristics in people who may not have developed them to the point that they're obvious in their work. Okay, well, thanks for that question as well. Uh, there is an assessment. Again, it's qualitatively uh, derived. I want to be clear on that. But if you break these things down into their behavioral elements, which is actually what we've done, there is a free assessment. It's actually in the back of the book. Or you can go to uh, my website, which is greatleaderserve.org, O-R-G, and under the resource tab, there's a free assessment. And it, again, it's an attempt to uh, break each of these down to behavioral, uh, applicable, tactical, observable behaviors so that you can observe them or not in ourselves and in others. And it actually might prove to be a good diagnostic for you as you try to figure out where you might want to prioritize some heart work. But that was the intent of the assessment. Great idea. Uh, there are so many more questions, and I'm trying to prioritize these. Here's one uh, that is also along the lines of that last question. Where would you start to sensitize a leader whose heart is not right? right say that again, please, Becky. Uh, where would you start to sensitize a leader whose heart is not right? Where would I start to sensitize a leader? Hmm. I think I might talk to that leader about their journey. How did they get to where they are? Now again, I don't know what you'll discover, but I'm just others on their journey. I mean, I'm finding fewer and fewer successful self-made leaders. I'm not even sure that it might be a myth. And if you can help them understand how others serving them assisted them on their journey, I think the fact that you even their level, can you pay it forward? Who can you serve just as you have been served? I might want to start a conversation about their leadership journey. So that's a wonderful question. Uh, that's my initial thought. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, here's a question from Jim. He wants to know of your books, the four of them, The Secret, Great Leaders Grow, The Secret of Teams, and The Heart of Leadership, which do you consider the most foundational to good leadership? Well, I think foundational is, is, is the iceberg. I mean, again, I want to go back to something I said in the beginning. Uh, leadership effective leadership, great leadership, is a combination of talent, I mean, it's, it's, it's skills and it's character. I mean, it's both. And so what's foundational, yeah, you will fail as a leader over the long haul if you just have character, and you'll also fail as a leader if you just have skills. Peter Drucker said it like this. He said, the quality of character does not make a leader but the absence flaws the entire process. So I guess by definition, since 90% is character, character would be foundational, but you gotta be careful because both are in play all the time. So if you say, ooh, I'm gonna work on my leadership character until I get it where it needs to be, well, you'll fail as a leader while you're working on your character because at the same time, you actually need to be leading. You need to be casting vision, you need to be building teams, you need to be solving problems, allocating resources, and doing those types of things. And so I think it's a both and, that they're both foundational. So as you reference the secret of teams, teams is a structural decision 
that a leader makes. Every leader has to decide how will we get the work done? How will we accomplish the task? Now what I believe, and someone mentioned uh, empirical data earlier, the last data I saw said that 96% of the time people working together outperform people working individually. So that's pretty good evidence for me that teams make sense. But that's a leadership decision regarding structure and how you get work done, and there's, there are practices and principles that govern how to build great teams, and that's what we wrote about in that book. But, but leadership is an independent challenge. You and I have to be able to lead well whether we're leading a team or not. So I think that the combination of leadership skills and leadership character, that's foundational. And 90% of your success will be determined by your heart. So I may, I may have rambled a bit there, but I hope you got the essence of what I'm trying to say. I think so. Um, so going back in the direction of young leaders, Julie says, thank you so much for your blog and this book. And speaking of developing young leaders, how would you recommend we use these principles to help grow our kids? I've got a nine-year-old Dynamo leader in the making and want to be intentional in my investment. Okay, uh, two quick thoughts. I wrote a blog post on that uh, three or four weeks ago, so that will give you more than I'm going to be able to give you right now. But um, I think it's really important as parents, I've got, I've got two, two sons, that we actually name whatever it is we're trying to instill in them. I think, we need that, I think it d demands that level of intentionality. What are those character traits, leadership or otherwise, that we want them to leave our house embedded in their, in their spirit. And so I think that is critical, and I think that's the starting point. And it may be these, it may be others, it may be a combination of things, but um, I found that to be really helpful in our lives. I remember when my son turned 12, I put together a plaque for him that had some traits that his mother and I had been trying to sow into his life and it was the first time I'd put them in writing and actually showed them to him. He was 12 years old, and he's now married. He's 25 years old, has, has a wife, and I have a grand dog now. And uh, I noticed not long ago, he's been, he's been out of the house a couple of years, but I noticed when he left home, everything was still hanging on his walls, but he took that plaque with him. So that, that was kind of a, a proud papa moment for me that uh, obviously the fact that we had taken the time to articulate those traits and uh, put them in place uh, obviously meant something to him. So that would be my starting point. And uh, if you want to know more, uh, again, I think about three weeks ago I wrote a post on actually taking these, um, these leadership character traits that we're talking about today and how to instill them in your, in your children. Thank you, Mark. So I just want to pause for a minute and mention that I don't think that we're going to get to all these questions, but what I want to say is that, Mark, I can export all these questions, and these might be uh, some motivation for you for future blog posts. You could answer them. Yes. Well, let me tell folks, because some people may not be familiar with uh, the site, uh, greatleaderserve.org. Every Friday, I answer a question submitted from a leader somewhere in the world, and I've been doing that. I don't know, Becky, probably eight or ten months. Mm -hmm. um, I blog three times a week, but again, one of those is always dedicated to answering a question. So that's, these will go to the top of that list, and uh, I'll start next Friday. I think today's Thursday. I've already written tomorrow's, but um, I'll start next Friday beginning to answer these questions. So thanks for sending them, and I would invite folks to continue to send me questions. Um, I'm relatively new at blogging. I've been doing it a couple of years. But I never wanted it to be a monologue, which is why uh, I got a little frustrated um, after that first year. I felt like I was doing all the talk. I mean, I'm appreciative of the comments, but I wanted more than comments. And so that's why a full third of the content at a minimum is me responding to your questions and your issues and your concerns and your challenges. So please continue to send those to me. Uh, I'd love to enter the conversation with you. Great. So I'm going to try to give you a few more as we wrap up the hour, Mark. Uh, Todd is wondering what the most important leadership lesson is that you learned in the past month. Oh, in the past month. Let me think about that. Um, I think it's uh, a lesson that I have relearned. 
Todd, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I have to learn some lessons over and over and over and over again. And this is one that I continually struggle with and that I have to be very careful and even vigilant regarding the pace of my life. Um, I think we can, we can do more harm than good as leaders if we let the pace of our life get out of control. And I do that from time to time. And my assistant has described October as the perfect storm. Uh, any number of factors, some within my control and some that were not. But I can't use that as an excuse. Uh, so I think we're 10 days into the month, and I'm, I'm in the eye of the storm. And I've already had a conversation with her about what can we do to be proactive and to never have another month like October. Um, I am fearful that my effectiveness will be off this month because the pace has actually gotten out of control. So uh, I will continue to, to learn that lesson, to relearn that lesson, and every time I run in the ditch, I'll come out of the ditch and try again. But that's, that's the leadership lesson I'm wrestling with right now. Okay, thanks, Mark. At least two people have asked uh, what the topic of your next book is or what topics would inspire your thinking for future books. Okay, well, those are two separate questions. Let me answer the one about the next book. Uh, some of you know about the book, The Secret of Teens. It was mentioned earlier. It's a book that was written after about 20 years of research here at Chick-fil-A and studying global best practices on teens for about 20 years. And so I actually wrote that book at the request of Chick-fil-A. And they were gracious enough to let me share it with the world. About three years ago, the senior leadership team at Chick-fil-A looked at me and said, what's after high-performance leadership teams? That's what I've been thinking about. And that is, in fact, the topic of the next book, which, if all goes well, will be out in the spring of 15. I don't have a, a working title yet, but it's about creating high-performance organizations. Because if you think about what a high-performance leadership team does, it really taps into the creativity and the energy and the passion and the engagement of a very small group of people. Uh, in the context of one of our ref restaurants, that may be as few as a half dozen people. But they've got 60 or 70 people on the payroll. So the question is, what do you do to get the other 90% of the people fully engaged, totally aligned, absolutely sold out to the vision and performing at their peak levels of effectiveness. And so that's something we've been working on for about three years. We're actually running a pilot in about 30 of our restaurants. It's going to be a year-long pilot starting next month, actually starting this month. That's another thing that happened in October. Uh, we're bringing in our restaurant leaders and their teams, and we're doing training, and we will actually run this for a year, back to the question of qualitative or quantitative, um, before we roll something out chain-wide, our finance team is going to come in and do an assessment to be sure this actually does have business outcomes that, that outweigh the cost. They're going to figure out what's the ROI on this, and we are quite optimistic. And so my current plan is that we would introduce this to the organization over a three-year period starting in 15, and that there would be a book to accompany that. So I'll keep you posted, but I'm really excited. About it. I can tell. I love to see you smile when you talk about that new book. Um, Mark, I had one question come in. Someone was asking if you could recap the acronym. A couple people joined the call late. So if you could just go back through H-E-A-R-T and yeah, what all those stand for. Let's see if I can do that right here. They can see it. Uh, leadership character, these are the fundamental traits, again, not an exhaustive nor definitive list, but, but a list of key and critical traits that I believe you and I uh, can and must cultivate if we want to be the leader that people want to follow, that we demonstrate a hunger for wisdom, that we've made a commitment to lifelong learning, that we expect the best, that, that we have an optimistic spirit, that we really do believe we can affect and if, if not affect, create the future. We're trying to create something that does not yet exist. That's what we're supposed to do as leaders, and, and, and expect the best uh, attitude certainly helps us there. We also need to develop the ability to accept responsibility. For some, this comes easier. For some, it's, it's more challenging. Now, the psychologists call this locus of control. And again, they would say there is a natural temperament or bent here. 
but there's evidence that people can learn to accept responsibility. And when we do this, uh, people are more willing to follow us. The flip side of that is that we've also got to be willing to share praise and to give praise and to give recognition. That we not accept all of that ourselves, um, but that we're willing to share it. The fourth is that we respond with courage. This is what gives action to leadership. Le leaders without courage are not leaders. I mean, you can't lead without courage. Everything we do of value and substance requires courage, whether it's to set a big goal or to set a bold strategy or to make hard people decisions or to allocate resources because there are never enough to go around. That leadership requires courage. We must respond with courage on a daily basis. And, and finally, and again, I, I think this is probably first among equals in my mind, uh, the best leaders think others first. One of the questions that Ken and I asked 10 years ago when we wrote The Secret, a question that we still ask, that I still ask on a regular basis, am I a serving leader or a self-serving leader? Because people always know. They always know. And if, and if we'll get that one right, it'll make it much easier to cultivate and nurture these other traits. So that's, again, a quick recap, and I hope it would, it would serve you. Great. Um, Mark, is there anything else that you would like to say that you haven't had a chance to share on this call? Yes, yes. I want to say that, again, there, there's, a, there's a verse of Scripture in, in the book of Proverbs that I think gives real insight here. Chapter 4, verse 23, it says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Ninety percent of leadership is about our heart. Ten percent is about our hands. We need both, but we have to guard our hearts if we want to be the kind of leader that people want to follow. And I hope this book will help. Mark, thanks so much, uh, and thanks to all of you for being with us today. We will be providing a recording of this uh, session and sending a special offer to you in the next day or so. Uh, we look forward to staying connected on social media. And uh, on behalf of Mark and the team at Weaving Influence, I want to thank you again for joining us, and have a great evening. Thanks, everybody.